Um, I had the opportunity to meet some of the people before, but Mord is the person, Dr. Dr. Nicola Mord is the person who I've been reading her papers and saying them for years. And um, she is an associate professor in the Division of Psychiatry at University College of London, UCL, and a qualitative methodolog methodologist and researcher in mental health. She has a long-standing interest in how psychiatric medication is managed and discussed between service users and practitioners, and in shared decision-making models and practice in this area. Her work includes explanatory studies to understand the views of service users, family carers, and practitioners about medication, and intervention studies that have developed and evaluated ways in increasing service users' involvement in medication decisions. She, has the, she, she was the qualitative lead on the recently completed RADAR study that included a large multi-site trial of antipsychotic reduction discontinuation in people with recurrent psychotic disorders. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you, um, David, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, this is such a great forum. Um, so, since the coffee break, we've had a lived experience talk, we've had a clinical service talk, and this one is going to be a research talk. Thank you. Um, so, I am really inspired by everything I've heard so far. I'm seeing links all the time between uh, what I'm talking about and what I've seen previous speakers talk about, and I think there's sort of real fruitful discussion. What I'm going to talk about today is some work that has happened within the what's called the RADAR randomised control trial, and um, it's a piece of qualitative work, but um, you need to understand a little bit about this trial first, so that's where we're going to start. Um, before I start as well, I just want to acknowledge um, my co-authors, uh, particularly Maria Long, um, who worked primarily with me on this, and Joanna Moncrief, who's the PI for the RADAR study, and other co-authors in RADAR more generally, and including, as Vanessa said, um, a lived experience panel from McPain. Um, so also, thank you to our funders, the NIHR, and to everybody who took part in our research. Um, I'm going to, first of all, show a short video which will contextualise for you something about the, the, rad the main radar randomised control trial that the work I'm going to talk about is embedded within. So hopefully we are going to be able to show a video. Yeah. Research into antipsychotic discontinuation and reduction. And we want to do this study because we really don't know at the moment what the best way to treat people who have long-term conditions like schizophrenia and psychosis is. We don't know whether it's better to continue to take antipsychotic medication as has been the traditional form of treatment, or whether some people might be able to reduce and even stop their medication if they get some help and support with that Sorry, 
is it difficult to understand? It sounds like there's two versions of it. Should I keep it going? No. Okay. I, I tell you what, I think um, I'll move on from that. Hopefully you've got that this is a, a trial of medication um, reduction and discontinuing. Um, let me just go back to my slides. Uh, okay. okay, so just briefly about this trial. Um, 253 people um, were randomised into this trial, were, were recruited into the trial. Um, the inclusion criteria were to have um, recurrent non-effective psychosis or schizophrenia um, over a, sort of a number of years. People were clients of community mental health services distributed around England and they had to be currently taking antipsychotic medication. And they were randomised into either maintenance antipsychotic treatment, which was the control arm, or the intervention arm, which was um, gradual reduction and possible discontinuation um, every couple of months um, with a protocol of reduction designed by the research team um, and lasting over 24 months. So the treating psychiatrist in the service oversaw the um, individualised reduction that was designed by the, the study team, and which was different for every, every individual depending on where they were starting from and what, what doses and medication types they were taking. Um, it was also flexible in that it could take account of um, service users' preferences, emergent symptoms and withdrawal effects and so on. And the outcomes that we measured in the trial at 24 months were social functioning and relapse as defined by a trial relapse committee, um, essentially needing hospital admission. So, if you're getting very excited about what the findings of this trial were, um, I have disappointing news. <laughs> The findings are coming out very soon of the main trial. Um, we had expected them to be out um, in the journal by now, and they're not, but um, I'll give the reference to where you can find them um, at the end of the talk. But what I am going to tell you is possibly, what well, I would say, a more interesting story from a qualitative researcher perspective, which is about an embedded study that uh, we've been doing within the group of people who um, reduced and potentially discontinued their medication. Um, and that's what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk, um, time talking about. So first of all, just to um, orient where this piece of research sits in relation to other research on experiences of antipsychotic dis discontinuation. There's a couple of things that I think it's worth just saying about how this is uh, different from quite a lot of other research. First of all, the process is for all with clinical guide, guidance. Um, some of the other qualitative small studies that have been done have been with people who've chosen independently to reduce their antipsychotics or come off them without um, working with a psychiatrist or without sometimes telling their psychiatrist. Um, so these are all people who've had the clinical guidelines. They're all doing something which is gradual, um, as I said, and there's obviously open acknowledgement and discussion with the prescriber about the, about the processes of doing this. Second thing is that the time frame is over two years, which gives us a really long, interesting time to explore. Um, and thirdly, that these are people who were open, open enough to reducing their antipsychotic medications to sign up to the research trial but wouldn't necessarily have chosen it or been hugely motivated in the same way that somebody who chose to reduce medication on their own might be. So what we did was we um, conducted interviews with 26 of the around 100 people who remained in the treatment arm at the 24-month follow-up point. Um, 
and the interviews asked about their experiences of the antipsychotic reductions, what the impacts were for them um, in terms of how that affected them as, as, as sort of human beings, um, social functioning, how they got on with their lives, also how it impacted on their mental health um, and what ups and downs they'd experienced over that 24 month period and what forms of support they'd drawn on and found useful. Um, and also how that might impact their views about medication for the future. We wanted to get a really um, diverse sample that broadly reflected the range of people who were in our main radar trial. So we sampled them carefully on demographic characteristics, um, on trial variables, um, like amount of um, dose reductions and um, relapse rates and also the types of medication and service histories that they'd had before coming into the trial. And we analysed the qualitative data thematically um, and collaboratively. And we had researchers um, that included a researcher with lived experience, both uh, collecting the data and um, helping us analyse the data. And I think you'll get a better sense of who these people were um, from this, and in particular, the bottom two sections of the far um, table. So in terms of um, who the people were, you can see from here um, a, a broad range of people in terms of um, age, ethnicity, uh, gender, um, and um, people who were primarily just taking one antipsychotic, but some people um, taking multiple antipsychotics and some people taking um, depot, long-acting depot injections um, with quite a wide range of long service, service use history. Um, but the particular things that I think are interesting are the changes in antipsychotic dose at trial end compared to baseline. Um, and there we've got a range. We've got some people who start who ended basically the same place as where they started, even though they may have gone up and down in the middle. Some people who ended with a slight reduction um, or a more significant reduction, and, and four people who had ended up with no medication at the 24-month period. Um, and the other thing that I think is interesting for you to look at is the rates of relapse. So um, 17 people had had no relapse, but nine people had had different forms of relapse, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And if we look at um, their actual medication doses, these are just six individual profiles taken from all of the people in the trial. They're not just the ones that we interviewed. But we've chosen these to give you a flavour of the diversity and of the, the reduction profiles as they were actually implemented. And what you should see is that the... the horizontal baseline is where they started from. So anything below that line is a reduction. And you can see that there are some people, uh, like the far one over there, who's got a sort of nice downward tra trajectory and then stays off their medication. There are 100% discontinuation. But for the most part, it's a more complicated line. There's some people, like the one in the middle at the bottom, who has hardly really moved during the trial, um, and other people who've gone up and down. And the red dots are um, relapses. So you can see that often when somebody's had a relapse, their medication was increased as a response to that following that, but then they may have gone down again. So those were all within protocol, which shows you that this is very much about flexibility and tailoring it depending on where individuals come from. So that already shows you some variability, but I think the qualitative data really um, shows an even more variability in terms of how people talk about and their experiences and make sense of them. And what I'm going to do in talking to you about this is do two sections. First of all, talk about how people described the actual effects of reduction. And then secondly, to talk about how they made sense of that um, in a more meaning-based way. So if we start with the reported effects of reductions, although I'm talking about um, a series of different effects, what I think is a, a more accurate picture is that over this 24-month period, 
people experience a range of both positive and challenging impacts, either one after the other or sometimes simultaneously, but it's easier for me to just present them to you one by one. So um, on this slide you'll see some um, aspects that look familiar to you if, you've, um, if you're aware of this field and which um, Lisette and other people have already mentioned. Um, so reductions of adverse medication effects, um, improvements to social functioning, impacts on sense of self, um, and then a whole cluster of more negative things to do with emotional intensity and deteriorations of mental health or, or relapses. And then finally a set of um, physiological and psychological difficulties that were short term um, and which we could talk about as withdrawal effects. So to take each of those in turn, um, we've already heard from other speakers about some of these common side effects and a, ma a large majority of people who experience some reduction also experience a reduction in some of these effects, particularly the sedative effect effects. The, so a re reduction in um, feeling mentally clouded, emotionally blunted, sedated, lacking in energy, um, sort of sleepy the whole time. Um, people found that they were more energetic, they could concentrate better, um, they felt more mentally alert. And um, those are the common ones. We had a few other um, more specific things like um, reduced um, reductions in increased appetite that can sometimes be a side effect of some antipsychotics, um, sometimes improvements in sleep and anxiety. Um, but as you can see from the, the quote, I'll, I'll have several quotes as we go through, the impacts of that are quite profound in that if you're feeling very sleepy and cloudy, clouded, it's difficult to get up in the morning, it's difficult to feel awake, it's difficult to get out and go and do a job or any, any other sort of social activities. Um, and they were often not, knock on indirect effects. So um, having a reduced appetite sometimes helped people to get rid of the weight that they'd gained, having taken antipsychotics for a long time. Um, feeling less sedated helped them feel more motivated to get out and do some exercise or do some social activities or do more daily chores and so on. And related to that were um, quite a lot of accounts of improved social functioning. Um, so being able to do more things like going out to work, um, being more sociable, um, but also that very much was bound up with the sense of who I am and who I was. And um, as we heard from other speakers, returning aspects of the self that had been sort of dormant whilst people had been unwell and taking medication for a long time. So people finding their sense of humour coming back, their creativity coming back, finding that they were much more... Um, it found, they found it easier to get out and make connections with their social lives and, and keep their friends um, closer and, and uh, their relationships um, were sometimes better. So you can see from these quotes, um, I was getting myself active again, things were getting done during the day, the house was getting cleaned, I was going shopping, meeting friends, I can concentrate, my walking's been better, I don't use a stick, I've lost a stone in the last year. But the second one, um, I think, gives a sense of the, the sort of up and down nature of this. I started functioning off medication, I was more sociable. I functioned as an average human being, as a normal human being. But I also had this time bomb ticking away underneath me where I feared a, psych a psych psychosis rebound, and a psychosis rebound did happen. So that takes us into the, the other side of, um, which was often simultaneous but um, a sort of overlapping. What we sometimes saw was a trajectory where in the early phases of reduction people were talking about those improvements and um, improved sense of self and social functioning but then that would morph gradually into um, more challenging periods during the programme and that's quite often that happened with a gradual increase in emotional intensity which started to feel increasingly less comfortable. So I think I'll just read this quote out. Um, when you stop taking it, you feel too much. And I think that's why I was drinking, to try and cover the feelings up. I thought the fact that it protects your nerve, I think the fact that it protects your nerves from feeling creepy or anxious or something like that, then all those feelings come back when you come off the medication. I think it made me feel more free and young 
but at the same time this feeling that your nerves are exposed and vulnerable to attack. So it was more of a feeling of excitement came back, because that excitement isn't there as much when you're on medication, but you don't know how to deal with it. So it's a sort of real ambivalent, mixed experience, this. Um, and that... Okay, great, I need to speed up. Um, so that quite often was the... St that and deteriorating sleep were quite often the tipping points into mental health deteriorations and relapse. Um, and sometimes also people had life stresses happening. Um, a lot of this was also happening during the pandemic as well. And nine people in our sample of 26 had a psychotic uh, relapse at some point during that 24 months. Five of them were defined as severe, um, which meant that they required hospitalization, and four were defined as non-severe, which meant they could be managed at home. And, as I said, typically doses were increased at that point. Um, and then, uh, yes, the other thing that people found challenging was short-term effects immediately following each reduction. Um, usually these would resolve within a few weeks, um, but, you know, a range of physical effects that I think we probably already know as identifiers, withdrawal effects, um, feeling shaky and sweating and, and itching and dizzy, um, but also psychological effects as well. Um, and those were most experienced by the people who made the largest reductions or discontinued. So, um, what I want to talk about for the uh, remainder of the talk is how people made sense of these experiences and what do these mean to them. And I think um, this is where I think it gets really interesting and relates to some of the themes that have already come up in some of our talks. Um, what we found in our analysis of this really rich data was that forms of learning or new, perspective, new perspectives related to the experience that they, people had in the trial of reducing antipsychotics in a tailored and supported way with clinical guideline, guidance was a novel opportunity for learning in a number of different ways. Um, first of all, people learnt a lot, or some people learnt a lot about medication, what its role was for them and what their position was on medication optimization. They also learnt about self-management strategies and relationships with clinicians. I'm going to focus in this talk on the first one about the role of medication, um, but I'll come back in my talk tomorrow, for those of you here, to talk more about relationships with clinicians. But the other thing to say is, just as I showed you already an enormous amount of variability, there's also an enormous amount of variability here. So whilst I'm talking about some people having almost a sort of transformative experience of um, <coughs> new learning and new perspectives, there were many other people in the sample who reported little overall impact of being in the trial overall. Um, and some people who really didn't like being in the trial, they just found it too challenging, the reductions were too difficult for them, the impacts of that were, were very negative for them and other people, and they overall had a negative experience. Um, but what I want to say is that the, the people who engaged and found this a learning experience, it wasn't that those people, quote, liked being in the trial and had no problems. They had um, as many problems and in some criteria more problems than the people who, who didn't feel impacted by the trial. So it's not a straightforward getting on well with reduction versus not getting on well with reduction. So... What people found was that the actual lived experience of going gradually down different medication doses helped people to tease out what's the medication, what's me, what's the illness. And for them, for, so for some people, they became very, very engaged in how it felt to be on this dose and then two months later on a slightly lower dose and a slightly lower dose, and they could give very coherent accounts of that. And that process also helped them to understand or to, to start to develop an understanding, a personalised understanding of what medication was doing in relation to, to themselves and, the, and their illness, and to work out perhaps what might be optimal for them. 
This was for many a novel opportunity. They hadn't done this before with a psychiatrist and several people thought that they wouldn't otherwise have been given the opportunity. But for some people, they really grasped this opportunity and made such a lot of it in terms of their understandings. And that gave them a sense of optimism and agency because what they, they could see was that rather than being told you need to take this high dose of medication for the rest of your life, end of, they could see possibilities and options for the future. So that also involved some people pivoting from quite a black and white view about medication as being all bad and I would want to stop this medication to realising that perhaps some other dose of medication might be more functional for them. Um, I've got a couple of quotes here that I think show that. Again, I'll read them out. So this is... What's interesting is that people sometimes experience very difficult relapses and, and the circumstances around a psychotic relapse, but they contextualised it within a sort of learning process. So this person saying, the relapse was not very helpful. That may not have happened without the discontinuation of medication. So that may be the only negative about it being in the trial. Having said that, without that happening, I wouldn't be on the lower dose now. This dose seems to be the dose that helps me concentrate. My words are not as difficult to choose under this dose. I, I really came to the conclusion that this is something I can live with. Um, I think I'm going to skip over. We're slightly short for time, aren't we? Um, I'm going to skip over the next one. Um, and I'm going to skip over this because what I want to talk about is the fact that um, there are different positions in this data set, I think, um, of people who were open to but wouldn't necessarily have otherwise chosen to reduce antipsychotics. And this is tentative and still sort of work in pro pro progress, but what I wanted to show you was that we think we've got a group that's about half of the sample our qualitative sample, that we described as active opt optimizers, who were these people who really engaged with this process of reducing their antipsychotics. And quite often they pivoted from, I hate medication, I just want to come off it, to living through an experience of reducing the doses, engaging with it a lot, and then coming to the conclusion that a smaller amount of medication was maybe something that they wanted to pursue in the, in the future. Um, although they also quite quite often said, and perhaps I'd like to try coming off it as well. Um, so they found the trial participation personally valuable and very significant, despite the fact that they, it had been a very rocky road. Um, and they found it empowering. They have also found it empowering to be able to have open dialogues with a prescriber, as opposed to sometimes, you know, we, as we know, people take their medication reduction elsewhere and don't even disclose it to a psychiatrist. But we also found another group who were engaging very differently and um, I'm not quite sure whether we've got the right names for them and I find it quite difficult to, to describe this heterogeneous group of people. These are people who perhaps weren't that keen on going into the trial and uh, um, reducing their medication in the first place. Perhaps they'd wished that they'd stayed in, it'd been in the maintenance arm. They often didn't make many reductions because that was their choice to do that. Um, sometimes they found the reductions very difficult to tolerate and they went back up to a higher dose. Um, some people really just didn't get on at all well um, physically and psychologically uh, with, with making the reductions. But the main thing about these people was that they didn't seem to particularly have a transformative or changed experience. It seemed like, yeah, I was in that trial but it didn't feel that much different from normal. And then there were some other people, a small group of about four people that we found difficult to classify into these, including two people who had very difficult um, break, service breakdowns and coercive treatment. And it's just to remind you that even in research trials, bad stuff happens when people are in contact with, with services, and that did happen with a small number of people. Um, so I think I will just read out um, these. So the first group, the active, active optimizers, even though I get really low days, even though I get overwhelmed, even though I can't sleep, I'm excited about life again. It sounds a bit heavy, but I don't feel like I want to die anymore. It's just normal emotions. 
I wake up in the morning, I'm not feeling tired, I'm not feeling like a zombie. That's so different for me. I haven't been doing that for the last 10 years. I wasn't interested in anything before. I want to live, and even though it's difficult, I can't give up now. Versus somebody who felt that really nothing had really impacted that much. I probably felt pretty much the same in between the reductions in medication. So a bit disappointed it wasn't a miracle cure. I didn't feel like a new lease of life or anything. So what can we learn from this? What might, what might the takeaways be? Um, firstly, that I showed you the reduction profiles, which were hugely variable, but it, people's experiences around that are even more variable, and then how people make sense of that overlaid on top of that is another source of variability. So a reduction process in a trial, it sounds like it's quite straightforward, it's just going down a set of numbers of a dose, but actually it's a whole very complicated can of worms. Um, so conclusions from our study, um, I think that what we, the conclusions we're drawing is that um, these were challenging experiences. I don't think that anybody had a sort of straightforwardly easy run on this. Um, but that for many people who were motivated, they could reduce their doses significantly. Discontinuation was much more challenging. Um, clinically, what, what clinical implications might be, you know, if you were recommending advice, you know, what should I expect if, I'm, if I think I'm thinking about reducing my medication? I think we should think about it being person-led, whether the person wants to do it themselves is really important. It being gradual, very, very slowly, and definitely flexible depending on how people are responding and what their preferences are. And I think clinical oversight and, and partnership working with clinicians is important. Um, and that people should anticipate um, perhaps the risk of me mental health deteriorations and relapse in that process. So, thank you very much for your time. So interesting that this is so common in which people do not necessarily follow exactly the guidelines of the medication use, and yet because we've ignored it, we have, we have missed the opportunity to learn about the fascinating processes and the opportunity to learn from these different patterns of use. So thank you so much for those very wonderful insights. Well, time for like one fast question because we're really running a little bit behind time. Please. I think really difficult to say. Um, there's so many different stories in this. Um, for some people, yeah, they just seemed, medication seemed to be the thing that worked for them. They, t they tried a bit of reduction. They experienced withdrawal effects or return of symptoms. They went back onto their medication and they preferred to stay there and that was fine. Other people then, they started to get more side effects and went back again. So it was very much in negotiation with the prescriber and I think each person's story and trajectory was different. Thank you. Thank you so much.